Um, I asked the crew to put this little thing up. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Um, it is a compressed version of what we did on our networks running on a Raspberry Pi pointing out the window. We'll see if it will work. But um, let's get to this. So um, IPFS live streaming, why? Um, this idea came from a couple of conversations we had about um, specifically bandwidth on meshes and how bandwidth is pretty precious because it's a shared commodity about everybody who's connected to it. So the other issue that we've seen meshes have is Netflix. How do you get people Netflix? Because that's what people want. Now, that wasn't really the problem we were trying to address, but the reality that people wanted to watch Netflix when they got home means that there's gonna be a lot of bandwidth that travels across this mesh. So how can we minimize that? Um, so I had this idea, we have this great thing called IPFS, and wouldn't it be awesome if we could somehow take this consumable content, put it on IPFS so that way it could get distributed across our mesh, hopefully um, lowering the amount of um, required uh, bandwidth that's requ that we need. So um, before I get into the IPFS component of it, just a really quick diagram of how our networks used IPFS to broadcast our stream. So on, the, on your right, there's the booth. Essentially, it's two HDMI inputs, one for the camera, one for the presenter. Um, that gets pushed out to a RTMP server, um, very similar like you would do for Twitch or YouTube or anything like that. From that point on, we split the stream into two. Uh, we got a clear HTTP setup donated for us, so that way if everything fell apart, because this is very experimental, we would still be able to stream something. And the other way, it goes into three servers, um, or two servers, sorry, it goes into an IPFS server that will actually do all the work. We're gonna talk about what it does in a moment. And then a mirror that would uh, collect all the content and actually be the thing that pushes it out. Um, and we were very happy that uh, Pitmesh was able to donate one of their servers for us to actually run all this off of. So thank you very much, Pitmesh. Um, so traditional streams. Traditional streams are kind of, un well, they are unicast. They send the stream to each individual person. If there's five people watching, each person has to get a copy of the video. So the bandwidth multiply multiplies with the number of people. If you have 10 people watching, you need 10 times the bandwidth. Um, the constant distribution network, that's what's used for much larger deployments like, like uh, Twitch. If you could get the bandwidth component um, re removed from the situation, say you had unlimited bandwidth, you would start bottlenecking at things like disk input and output and, and things of that nature. So they basically just fixed that problem by putting a lot of computers down. So that's how traditional IPFS, uh, traditional streaming works rather. So the theory. Content is locally cached on IPFS gateways. The more gateways you have, the more content sources you have, and the source gateways don't need to push to every single user, right? If you can get it up half the way, that content could be picked up from there and sent the rest of the way. All right, that's pretty cool. So how IPFS works, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, because uh, this is a lightning talk, but very, very high level. You request that, um, if you wanna add some content into IPFS, you request that that file be added. IPFS then reads the file and creates a hash, which is a fingerprint. And then um, IPFS adds that content into its own repository, linking it to the hash. On the other side, how do you request information? You re either request it right from the IPFS server or through some kind of a gateway, and you say, I want this hash. IPFS does its magic. Um, and sends you a copy of the uh, requested information. All right, so far so good. But how do you hash something that hasn't happened yet? It's a pretty big problem. I mean, IPFS takes the information, runs it through an algorithm, and gives you a, a fingerprint, but if it hasn't happened yet, well, we don't have a crystal ball. So how do we fix that problem? Well, enter HLS. Uh, HLS is, it was developed by Apple in 2009, it breaks the stream into small chunks. Uh, a sequence of chunks makes up the stream, and a playlist describes the stream. So, uh, quick example, you have a playlist that says chunk one, chunk two, chunk three, chunk four, and then it references those particular short bursts of video. So, it breaks the stream into small chunks. So solution, what if we just hashed individual chunks? So that's what we did. We created a very simple loop, 
wait for an HLS chunk to be created, add it into IPFS, rewrite the M3U8 file, which is the list of sequences, to reflect the new hash, publish the M3U8 file somewhere, and do it all over again. So we used FFmpeg to create the HLS stream. FFmpeg spits out an M3U8 file and the chunks as they become available. Uh, we used the source of an RTMP server, but other sources are very easy. Um, well, we never got the camera up and running, uh, worked earlier, but you can do a Raspberry Pi, some other external encoder, a video file, and you run that in the background, right? So the command FFmpeg, et cetera, et cetera, and FFmpeg is off and running. So now you gotta wait for the chunk. So there's a piece of uh, software called iNotifyWait that checks to see if the file is finally closed, if uh, the, whatever program is writing to it's finished, and if it is, returns control over to the, um, the script. So, so far so good. Well, once the chunk is done, we add it into IPFS, IPFS add, and then we just have to record what that hash is and what the file name is, so that way we can rewrite that M3U8U file later. So this is on the left, what oh, your left, uh, the M3U8U file looks like. It's very simple, it has um, a length of the, um, the segment and the file name. And what we want is we want the length of the segment not to change, but we want to rewrite where that segment is instead of looking at its own local HTTP server to look on IPFS. So we copy the non-IPFS M3U8 file, we read the log of all the file names and hashes, and simply replace them. And final step is publish. Well, IPNS has a great thing called, sorry, IPFS has something called IPNS, which is designed just for that, where you basically add the new file you want and you publish it using IPNS and the hash will not change. Because remember, every time you change the file, the fingerprint changes, which is kind of useless if you need a static point. So, I mean, mission accomplished, what could go wrong? There's a little script. They say there are two hard things in computer science. Cache and validation, naming things, asynchronous callbacks, and off by one errors. We hit them all in one way or another. Naming things. Well, I'm gonna go pretty quick through this because there's been a lot of problems and my time's ticking. Um, FF, if FFmpeg restarts, the numbering sequence starts from the beginning. You also get duplicate names. Remember how I said you go through log and you replace? Well, all of a sudden, um, live one has now two entries into it. The last live one and the new live one. And replacing the names just doesn't work anymore. And the video stalls. Also, we learned very quickly last week, Bash does not like dashes in their uh, variable names. We got these weird, weird words coming in to our log. We had no idea where they came from. Well, what we ended up doing was naming each playlist list uniquely, so if FFmpeg ever needed to restart, it would be a different name. We also wrote out our own M3U8 file instead of referencing the one that uh, FFmpeg would create for us. That way, we didn't have to worry about search and replace and having these collisions. Well, cache and validation, or rather, why is my file not changing? Well, the M3U8 file does not update. That was our problem but the browser says it's cached, why? Well, the video stream stalled again. If it has no new chunks, it can't play anymore. Oh, the reasons why. IPNS was very slow. It takes sometimes over one minute to update. Actually, it sometimes takes two minutes. Sometimes it takes 10 seconds. We couldn't really figure out why, but if your video chunks are 30 seconds long, you, you need it a little faster than two minutes. That's four times as slow. Um, IPNS can also take some time to find it. And IPNS just doesn't change fast enough. All the reasons why the video stalls. So the good guys at IPFS did their best to try to help us. And help us they did. Um, the reason IPNS takes so long is because so many people are running it behind a NAT. And we can't really fix that. Although IPFS did try to load the network with a bunch of new nodes to help with that. So we started using an experimental feature called IP, I, uh, PubSub, which uses a different methodology to push the stream, and it worked. Works 100% of the time. Only if the PubSub is enabled on the gateway you're using, it's now enabled on IPFS IO, 
and bigger chunks make it more resilient. Problem is it only works about 80% of the time. It just randomly stalls. IPFS guys are still working on it, but what's the solution? Not to use it at all. Honestly, the M3AU file is under 700 bytes long, so we just host it on HTTP. Um, side project, because we have a log, we were able to build playlists of an hour long, so that way anybody who wanted to watch a talk that missed it could actually rewind and watch the talk. Best part is, it wasn't a lot of work. It's already in the IPFS cloud. Then, about four days before the launch, we had a problem with the um, with SSL. Our website used SSL, our player didn't. Well, we did a quick reverse proxy, everything works great, except the IPNS file doesn't update anymore, because NG uh, Nginx was caching our file. We had to turn that off too. Asynchronous callbacks, or wait, when did that happen? Well, we're not doing JavaScript, so there's no asynchronous callbacks, but we are running threads. IPFS runs in, in its own separate thread, FFmpeg runs in its own separate thread. The process runs its own separate thread. What could possibly go wrong? Well, if IPFS stops, things just don't work. So we had to make a script to keep IPFS up and running if it ever were to shut down. Luckily, it's not a big problem. If FFmpeg breaks, everything stops. Um, we, worst of all, we found that it, um, if we even continue the stream, the, sh the actual stream is broken, it's a new stream with new indexes and new everything. So, you know, luckily there's a tag we found at the last minute that fixes all that in the M38U file, so yay. Um, and um, I notify get stuck. If things just don't line up properly, it's watching a file that never gets closed because it's never written to. Not a good thing. And off by one errors, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, but those sequence time codes were killer. So seeing how I have one minute left, I'll give you some bonus stuff. Cross-site scripting. I don't even know where to start with that, but every time we tried something, oh, uh, it's cross-site scripting, can't do anything. Here's a fun one. Firefox won't accept chunks that are bigger than 20 megs. Gives you a random error. That one was fun too. Companion add-on. Wouldn't it be great if you were the gateway for the person next to you? Well, IPFS thought so, but it just didn't work. Last possible minute, they finally found the bug in Firefox that fixed that. And mixed content. Well, that SSL certificate that we installed sure gave us problems. And I probably could have gotten that camera working if I went directly to the gateway, but I can't do it because the player is running on HTTPS. So those are just some of the issues that we ran into trying to get this to work. But the nice thing is, is that it worked. Uh, the stream was pretty solid the whole time, and um, we got a really cool package out of it that can be deployed in under about 10 minutes uh, for anybody else to replicate what we've done. So I think we have like 30 seconds for questions. I'll try to talk fast if anybody's got anything. Yes. Interplanetary file system. That the question was what does IPFS stand for? Yes. Well, 100% of the time, it works 80% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these things are fixable. The technology is very new. I think today we, and yesterday we proved that this is possible. All the big issues we had with the live stream happened before it even got to the IPFS server with audio sync issues, with things not working. So I'm happy to say that our model, although it might not be 100% IPFS only, at least it works. And if anybody wants to try it out uh, on the Toronto Mesh prototype node in the beta, in the development uh, stream right now, there is a module called Pi Stream. So if you have a Raspberry Pi camera, you can try it out. Thank you to Yurko.